who will just go around, who we have around the table today. We have Andy Berman, one of our usuals, Julian Smith, myself, Kevin from Airhouse, and Siki Chen from, I want to say, Runway currently, right? Not the one that we should talk two episodes ago, and the other one. And also from what you were a, you were at Hay, and then you were at Sandbox VR, where you're one of the founders, and you still sit on the no, board the founders. No. I was CEO briefly. I was chief product yep. officer, but I joined as an early investor and chief product officer. Got it. Okay. And then you were VP product also at Postmates. So you had quite a career. How long have you just been around a lot? Are you doing a bunch of things all at the same time? How are you getting it done? I'm really curious. Literally ask me, are you old? That's kind of what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. I want to be delicate. I, about for the it. record, everyone on this podcast is old. <laughs> I've been around for a little bit. Yeah, I'm almost four. 40 this year, but I moved to the Valley in 07. I joined a search engine startup out of school called PowerSet. Before that, I was working for NASA JTL. So, but yeah, right around that time, I started my first company called Hey Inc., which, oh no, it was well, Serious Business App, actually. We we're building names for Facebook. And so, yeah, I'm kind of, it's just weird. I'm used to sort of being the youngest person in the room for 10 mm -hmm. or so years. And now, yeah. you've been around for a while. You're it's old. Funny. Yeah, that resonates with me a lot because I remember being the kind of the young upstart and I still yeah. think of myself that way. That's still kind of my identity. I, you know, you, those of you that are not watching this on half of his head is shaved. The other half is not shaved. It's clearly like on purpose. It wasn't a deer. And so clearly there's a part what? of you at the same time that is saying, this is my identity, which is the young upstart. Like, it's still a part of you. Does that make sense? From the best life crisis on your head. Yeah. I was at Walgreens and this little girl came up to me, pointed my head and was like, excuse me, is that a joke? No. Um, <laughs> oh. Yeah. So, so, dude, we're, I mean, it's when we're recording this, it's the 3rd of January, 2023. I don't know. Let's first be begin maybe. I'm curious and I'm sure the audience is curious about what, level of freaking out you are doing as a founder relative to maybe the prior time that you were doing it. A lot of founders are freaking out. A lot uh, of VCs more importantly are freaking out. Maybe, yeah, yeah. Or there you go. Or maybe that's more important. <laughs> how is your, how do you feel about your company? Not in terms of the progress of the company, but more from an ecosystem standpoint. What did you do to adapt? Did you do anything to adapt or nothing? I mean, I want to be as transparent as I can, but honestly, it's, Overall, the ecosystem has been good for what we're doing. Yeah. Because you know, we're, what, we're, what we do is we help companies plan better and get their finances in order right. and understand where the money is going and how much runway they have. And turns out everyone all of a sudden now cares about that. Right. And we're also very fortunate to raise a large amount of money that we really haven't spent yet. So from an ecosystem perspective, it's probably better for our company in particular, but I'm a pretty prolific investor and you're right. <laughs> A lot of people are freaking out and they probably yeah. should be. I mean, last year and the year before was the best we've ever seen it. And right. the last quarters and the coming year or so, it's probably going to be the worst. We, most people have ever seen it maybe since 08 or so. So it's not fun out there. Do you, do you, do you, do you, do you agree with that? Do you honestly think that you've been through some cycles? You think this is going to be like the, like, I, I would think like most people that I'm listening to or whatever, they're saying the first half of 2023 is going to be like the worst ever. Do you really believe that? Yeah, I do. The sort of macro trading circles I'm in, there's general consensus of that in the next two quarters are going to see, is going to see a even further downturn than we've seen in the last two quarters. Right. And I think that's probably the consensus in the private markets. And so my God, and there's just a huge, backlog of people waiting to go out, right? People at the end of right. the year, we'll see right, right. we're going to be. And so it's the it's enormous supply and demand that's matter over the next two quarters. And what's going to happen in Q3 and Q4, who knows? But I think there's going to be a lot of fear from those first two quarters. And I don't think that's going to change very quickly. It's interesting. I was, I got a random call from Rocket Internet the couple of weeks ago. This is, they get on the phone with me. One time I randomly took their money and every little while they call me. And so I get on the phone with Oliver Sam Warren. Okay. You may not like most, I think many, most people in tech kind of know who Oliver Sam Warren is. Do you want to explain what rocket internet is for but, our listeners? Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah. So, so for those of you that have not been around or 
traumatized or some other thing like that. The famous thing from Oliver Samwar, there are Samwar brothers to be clear. Actually at Breather at my last company, I hired a number of Rocket Internet alumni because they are grinded to shit by Rocket Internet. And as such, they're actually operators come out of there. Talked over maybe by a rocket internet or not, but they're operators by the time they get out. So I'd heard about Oliver, and there are two of them, and they're famous for having made an eBay clone in I want I don't even actually know what year, but then having I think sold it to eBay, if I remember correctly, after showing people around the office and saying, Hey, you should buy us because we're gonna compete with you here in Europe. And then what they then did the more famous story up to this is they then try to make an Airbnb clone around, you know, 2011, 2012 or something. And so they went out and there's a famous story where I think Brian Chesky is like, I am going to, I'm getting basically threats because if it, you know, Airbnb is a global network effect, it's not a local. So you can't like win Paris, but lose London like you're fucked. And so as a result of that, this was a particularly important threat to Airbnb, but they chose not to buy the company. And in fact, they were able to beat whatever that company was that the Stemware brothers made. And instead they went off to create many clones, including HelloFresh, which is actually a pretty successful company in the United States. There's actually a buddy of mine that I worked with that started whatever successful ish. And so he called, he gets on the phone, the point. And we're talking and we're talking about like, runway, not your company, but just the amount of runway that people have. And he says to me, the people that are in my portfolio have 36 months of runway on average. And I was like, what? Because it, it confused the shit out of me. And I said, congratulations. It didn't feel like an average amount to most of the CEOs that I know and that I have in my, let's say, network. So first of all, does that resonate with any of you? Do you think you have 36 month wait, maybe 60, you might have or something now, but it, does that it all feel right to anyone in the panel? Well, we have five years. Yeah. Um, wow. And yeah. Wow. I mean, one thing I talk when I talk to portfolio companies and you know, everyone's like, how much should I raise? How much evolution do I want to give up? And the thing I like to tell them is there's many paths of success, but there is only one thing that all successful companies all have in common, which is that they're not dead. And so right. I definitely optimize against that. But yeah, that is not common. But you know, when you look at modern SaaS products, the Figma, Airtable, Notion, Codas of the world, I mean, they, each of them took three and a half to five years to get go to market. Oh, yep. That's a range. And so, and, you know, what we're trying to build that runway is somewhere between Notion plus Excel, and it's going to take time. So, yeah, I think depends on what you're doing, but I like to have a lot of runway because if you are building something, it does take time today. I actually have an opposing view to that. I don't think that I've ever had more than, uh, I don't know, two and a half years of runway ever <laughs> by design that I like. In my seed round for Era House, we did, it was like two and a half million bucks. You can't hire that many people for that. Like, I, I really like the idea of having constraints and like, you have to like prove and you're going to have to choose between doing this one thing or other thing. If you have like unlimited runway and you could just go on forever, it's just, like, there's no pressure at all. And I think that's actually one of the benefits of having the, of being a startup is that you have the this pressure that you are going to run out of money and you're forced to really make decisions that will get you to the next level. I actually would not want to do that. Now, I've never been in the situation that investors are like, here's a, we're profitable and here's an extra $200 million. And mm -hmm. I'm just going to put that in the bank for a rainy day. So I've never been in that situation, but I actually like the pressure that it puts on myself, which then obviously goes down to the team and forces people to make tough decisions. Yeah, I you know, disagree. Pressure and constraints are a really important thing for us. Having the money does not in any way reduce the pressure. I mean, we talk internally about we are now two years old. You look at the two right. years, tell me how much have we gotten done and where should we be? And there is the constraint of the clicking of the ticking clock. Um, right. That doesn't change. And so, yeah, I generally agree with you. I just think that you know, there's different ways to give you give yourself constraints. And one of the things that I'd rather not have is if we're 
in a place where we're supposed to make it and we need a bit more time and the markets are closed to not be done. Yeah, right. So I think it's very interesting because I've always had this view that it takes two to four years to build a good product. And I think there was, we, when we all started operating, we were in the MVP world, the Eric Reese, the lean startup, and that was put something out and iterate on it. And the companies you just <clears throat> mentioned, Sigma, Notion, Airtable, Coda, they've taken a really long time to build an incredible product and a massive amount of capital. And what do you think happens in this, in a new macro? Do we revert to the MVP? Is that even possible in today's SaaS markets, given mm. how no. developed MVP software sucks. is? MVP sucks. That's a suck. really good question. Yeah. It's hard to imagine. I think companies that want to do something like Figma or a notion is going to just going to be forced to do more with less. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, you're going to look for the closest market yeah. opportunity. It's actually yeah. something that I will say that at practice today, I, we do build wide. And then once having built wide, we would build deep. So for, but there's probably like an MVP version of our product that we could have built with 2 million, 3 million less dollars. Yeah. We would have just had to gone extra deep on the use cases, gone extra deep on that customer pain point. And only when they're really screaming, yes, this is it. Okay. Let's build on that. Yeah. Right. That's what I do. Yeah. I mean, I mean, products can be very different, right? If you think about what makes Figma or a notion, a notion, it's the flexibility of it, right? It takes a lot of power. I think a lot of time to build something of that kind of flexibility. And if mm. you go really deep on something, you can address one you kids really, it's just a different product, right? And you can build a fairly large business that way, but it wouldn't be the same domain, right? Something like some products is solving for a very specific workflow. The notion does it. The notion, notion can do anything. Well, I think they're, what we're all getting at here is building horizontal product-based companies. Yeah, it takes a lot of capital and True. a lot of time. And I think then yeah. there's at the other end of the space there's vertical SaaS, which shouldn't take as much capital and mu as much time because you're building for one specific persona. Right. And then I think there's probably somewhere the service, the, the the tech company that is really a services company that is a spreadsheet at the end. And most of those are just, you can get them up to speed very quickly, get into revenue very quickly, and then kind of fake it till you make it actually building the real software. And right, I think right. about that as brokerage type businesses or so on and so forth. When I mean brokerage, I think three naturally comes to mind. Sorry, Kevin. It's fine. I'm not dragging in the freight business. That's I think, I mean, but, uh, yeah, I mean, fair. half do you take towards your product market fit like matters a lot it determines the ultimate outcome of product i remember talking to you know, i know julian we're both like and recent companies talking to someone from and recent about the atrium story right that's a cons of yeah and i remember in retrospect when they're telling me they what they wish they would have done is just been heads down and building software instead right it work. and it's like they were able to scale they have lawyers and they have a services business can you so, tell the story more more in detail for the listeners it's a great story go for it I'm not super close to the story, but basically this was, I think, Justin Kong's maybe third or fourth company. And the idea was to disrupt legal law firms through technology. Uh, the idea is that a lot of the work that is required to close an MA transaction around the round can be largely automated. And that was the thesis. And I think, you know, from a, a, a thousand foot view, what it looks like, how they executed is they hired a bunch of lawyers and they actually were the law firm record for a number of companies. And on the back end, they try to catch up to build software to make that work. And the software didn't catch up fast enough. And so yeah. what happened is the prices that the companies were paying couldn't cover the cost of these extremely expensive lawyers who were basically doing full-on lawyer work. And so I think at some point, Justin decided to give the money back. I think the investors, right? That's right. And so in retrospect, I think that would have been, I mean, who knows what would have happened, right? When none of us were there, but the idea is that if the idea was to build a technology platform for lawyers, maybe they should have just done that. Um, yeah. And that mm -hmm. would have get more yeah. runway and force them to automate faster and improve that technology. It's, it is a really interesting example because since they had the lawyers on the back end, they were going to deliver the legal work. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Since they were going to deliver the legal work, they weren't going to lose the customer. And as a result of not losing the customer, there's no like startup pain of, oh, we suck. Right. Yes. Now, it's a particular example that I'm not sure how generalizable it really is, 
But having, I think I talked to Justin, I went to the dream offices actually to talk to him, not about yeah. this, but just, he was, you know, we were just shooting the shit. And he, the leader would say, yeah, we never really add product market fit. And, and it doesn't, that it is, it's the risk that I'm sure you understand, Tiki. It's like this risk of, oh, I'm fundable forever. Not the company, but, uh, but me, you know, you. And so for me, it, yeah, I will say that I, you know, I raised eight from Andreessen. Do I wish I had raised 12 today? Did I have it? Yes. You know, but at the same time, it's probably forcing me to execute properly. Sounds like exactly. Kevin, it's a strategy. Yes. I don't know. I, it I is my strategy. Know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, with that is a very interesting. Atrium, I'm not sure if they just do they have a lot of disintermediation. Like at, at at certain points, like there are certain things that they could pull off better than an actual law firm. But for them, like you just need a lawyer for certain types of things. It wasn't that kind of the story and why they ultimately didn't continue on. They didn't have enough leverage in the software. All the details. Okay. Of it. We just move on then. Nobody knows. We're, maybe, yeah, maybe we'll yeah. get Justin on here and he'll talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> what we took away from that is like when we were thinking about the early days of Runway, do we just have an in house CFO? Can we just mm -hmm. do that work for you? And there's a number yeah. of companies who are doing that. And we we intentionally decided to not do that for that. Reason. Yeah. And like we wanted the product to work. And right. we needed pressure in order to build mm -hmm. that product. Otherwise, you yeah. can always just fall back to, yeah, CFO is going to use the pressure. Right. Wasn't right. that what Pilot did, I think, at the back? That was, the, it's basically manual bookkeeping on the back end as they built, uh, as they tag data. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Inter it's a very it's interesting a lot, problem. There's a lot of opportunity right. to kind of manually do human manual labor, but then it could really make you lazy, I think, if you probably have the capital is maybe the lesson. I don't know. So I'm curious. I'm going to move on to one of the topics that we had. We had a lot of people making predictions and we kind of touched on this already a little bit here. One of the big predictions, and this is from Fred Wilson, who is extremely large in crypto. I love to get your guys' take on, do you think that crypto still has some legs going in 2023? It's been, there's obviously been some winners, like of any hype cycle that happens, right? You think of Airbnb, the sharing economy, right? There were so many different mm -hmm. companies came out of that. Airbnb was the one that won. You have Uber that kind of deliver anything to you off of your phone. There, there was a few more that kind of won there. Do we think that crypto and Fred's opinion is that it's still very early innings on this? I mean, he's extremely bullish. Do we think that is going to be something that's going, we were all, we all have been in the Valley for a number of years. Is this kind of a dead category or do we Fred, think? Is he, did he say something recently? Yeah, he put out in his, what will happen in 2023 and he's extremely bullish on, he talks about Ethereum specifically, but he still does think that Web3 has a lot more to, to grow into. I'll tell you. Just from my perspective, having read that post, it's the climate bit that really got to me. I have, I'm not an expert. I just want to say this. I'm a fucking idiot. But <laughs> if, so Fred Wilson, Fred Will, I, I think of Fred Wilson and Chris. He's Dixon a genius. To the thing. Here. Okay. So <laughs> Chris Dixon is always right. Fred Wilson also, for some reason, is all, always right. That's true. And so it's only those, it's those two. Everyone else is wrong a lot. And so... Mark Andreessen, maybe get, add him into that. No, Mark and, no way. Mark Andreessen has made a lot of mistakes, and I'm sure would acknowledge that. So when it comes to, to Fred Wilson, him saying, we've been vet investing in climate for three years, suggests that there is a market for climate products. And... That to me is super compelling. He probably, I, mean, I think he has to continue to believe when you go that deep into crypto, you can't stop believing it into it. Probably it's just the technology, but I'm really interested in the perspective of, I mean, would you ever start a climate company just to generally to the panel? Like has, is any, is anyone ballsy enough to actually do that? Because I thought I about it. I'm not, you have, I have thought about it. I have okay. a really close friend from college who is very senior at a large at Fortune 500 who focuses on their climate strategy. 
and has made their climate strategy a, vi a viable business. And we have talked a bunch about what you can do. I think to a large degree, a lot of the climate strategies out there are financial engineering. So mm -hmm. in carbon credits, it's we've done some way to offset the carbon footprint and we're going to go sell it to people. And there are real markets there and there are real products. Think things like clean oil that's been offset on a carbon credit being sold to a airline or being sold to P&G uh, for all their production. At the opposite end of the spectrum, there's like nuclear fusion and nuclear power. And I'm not going to touch that with, a, with a, like a nine foot pole. But I've definitely mm -hmm. thought about the financial engineering versions of it. But that happens to be because I have a close friend who is very involved in this market. Yeah, you actually know people that you can bounce shit off of. I know zero. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I know nothing about this at all. And I just, yeah, yeah this is not an area that I would go into. I think and that Andy, it's eventually right. going to happen. Andy, you were right. In fact, that is what Fred Wilson talks about. He talks about carbon credits, particularly as being kind of like one of the major things that he really believes will, uh, I don't want to say take off, but whatever, that will have legs. And well, he, he predicted in 2022 that it was going to be a big year for carbon credits. Well, I mean, it was. There was low carbon was started, guys. And Dreesen gave them how much money? I don't know. I don't know how good they were doing it. I don't know. I, I'm totally joking. I have no actual <laughs> clue. I just know they raised a bunch of money to do something mm. with carbon credits. Yeah. Wait, Wait, Nikki, talk about that. Why... Go ahead, after you. Flow, is that the we company? Or that is the WeWork company. Yeah, it was like 300 million, something like that. Some crazy. Yeah, thing. so does anyone know what they're doing? Nope. It's a Mark Andreessen company. They, he, he's never wrong. Did yeah, somebody like, just say the that? Why the valuation was high <laughs> that the guy bought like a billion of dollars worth of real estate or something. I think <laughs> that's the other one, but maybe I'm wrong. I thought okay, they had a more, different company that, yeah. It's a, yeah. No idea. Or maybe it morphed into that. That was the pivot from carbon credits to real estate. Could be. Could be. But how did you end up deciding that this would be the next company that you would work on, having had probably tons of different opportunities to work on various things? How did this end up being yours that you decided you were going to spend probably five, 10 years doing? Oh, man. Yeah, that's a great question. It, there was a specific trigger around the pandemic, but it actually goes back really far. I think like a lot of people in tech, have a technical background and major in math and, you know, I'm a hacker. So, you know, I got my start building games on Facebook. And so when I moved into city of seven, I had this game that took off on Facebook and then BT started wanting to funny it. And long story short, six months later, I was like 23 years old. I had a company and I was the yeah. CEO. Mm -hmm. And so I would get these like spreadsheets and these forecasts. And I did not know what margin mean. I feel like this whole area of finance and business has been like yeah. the security for me forever. I literally didn't actually know what margin and how it was calculated until I was responsible for the metric at those rates. Yep. And, and so with the contribution margin, now I had, uh-huh. What is mm -hmm. that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and there's like this story about Richard Branson. So he was in a sport meeting in the early 90s. It's like already huge. And mm -hmm. over the course of this board meeting, slowly started dawning on the rest of the board members that Richard Brassett does not know what marketing is. And wow. so after the board meeting, one of the board members took him aside and said, Richard, just so you know, here's how margin is calculated. And Richard says, oh my God, thank you. Someone finally explained this shit to me. Yeah. And this is so common. But anyway, so I've been always just been like invisibly insecure and didn't want to tell anyone about it. And I went to Sandbox. So Sandbox, for people who don't know, is this like really complicated business that involves like VR and games as content. And yet we build our own hardware. Then we construct mm -hmm. retail stores, staff them and operate them. So extremely high CapEx business. And so we really needed to understand how we're going to deploy our capital and how much runway we're going to have and how much we need to raise and all that. So I had to put together an actual financial model from the front. Mm -hmm. And over, it was over the course of working on that that I realized that this really sucked. It's, you know, like to model like employees and locations and games and to do it in Excel. Ex the thing that Excel is the, it is the most amazing powerful piece of software ever. It can do anything, but not anything specifically well. Yeah. And so break down like a product like Airtable or a Coder or Notion. What Airtable has done is it's taken Excel 
and uh, unbundle a very common use case of Excel, which is the database use case of Excel. Mm -hmm. And if you unbundle it and you invent new primitives and you make the primitive a row instead of a cell, you can build very powerful new workloads. And so the trigger for Runway was basically we just raised our Series A about into 2018, right, from Andreessen. And then we deployed $30 million, launching 20 stores, constructing them. And they it's were a sandbox, right? Sandbox, sandbox VR, yeah, yeah. 2018. And so uh, I was appointed CEO shortly before our Series B was supposed to happen. This is like late 2019. And then all of our stores were going to be ready to launch in March of 2020. Shit. And so, the, I mean, the stores that were live, they were printing money. They were doing great. You know, mm -hmm. we were number one thing on TripAdvisor in Hong Kong and a bunch of other things. And so, all of a sudden, we were a hot deal. And then no one was turning our calls because lockdown started happening. And then all of the revenue went to zero. And so now, we're going to our existing investors and we're doing scenario plans, right? And this is March of 2020. Nobody knew how long COVID was going to last. It right. was really before that. People were making fun of Andreessen for saying we're not shaking hands anymore. It's like, they're totally like, you know, paranoid about this. This is not even a real thing. And so I went in and we had to prepare like, what happens if COVID is three months? Elon mm. thought it was over by June of 2020, remember? He did. Mm -hmm. And three months, six months, 12 months, 24 months. Andreessen were the only people like, it's going to be a two year long thing. And I was like, you guys, these guys are insane. That's fine, two years. Turns out there were only people correct two years ago about right. exactly how long it's going to be. So anyway, we were just emailing these spreadsheets back and forth. And long story short, we had a hibernated company, lay off 95% of the company, including myself and the rest of the executive team, like skeleton crew. And right afterwards, I was talking to your CFO. So all of that stuff that we were doing in Excel and just like copy and pasting, like there was something better we could have used, right? Mm -hmm. was, and surely we just didn't buy the things. Like this is all there is. Right. Not when I thought, talked about recently, it was like, maybe show me someone should build a Figma for five years. And that's how Rome got started. That is, so that's, that resonates with me a lot, that story. I learned in a super operationally expensive, complex business, how to read any Same. financial document. Same. Yeah. Yeah, of course you're right. Of course, Kevin, because you had, you, we were in, uh, but you were in on-demand economy where you were handling some of the physicalness of it. And so you had real costs. So we had warehouses, right. we had vehicles, mm -hmm. we had employees. Yeah. yeah we had everything. Mm -hmm. It's insane. I feel like we've all run very operationally intensive businesses. Yeah, but you knew what mm -hmm. you were doing. Andy, you know what you were doing. You had just been laid off from Lehman Brothers in 2008. So don't tell me that you didn't know what the fuck you were doing. You knew what you were doing. You're the only one that knew. Yeah, for me, I was a pure technology. I was a programmer before, and then I started Ship, which is this this very CapEx intensive. You're, I can identify with this story so much. What is a p &L? What is gross margin? Yeah. What is contribution margin? What are all these things? I was learning yeah. on the go. It's, so, it's and for an example, it's Paul Graham's schlep blindness. If we've been through it, right. so I'd yeah. not be able to start Seeky's company because I have schlep blindness. I'd be like, yeah, that this is just how it works. Right. I and sat through doing doing positions, right? Like we all, for me, at least, I think a lot of people in our was like, well, I'm a product guy. I'm a tech guy. Right. Right. I'll hire a fractional CFO or a CFO. They'll take care of this. Mm -hmm. They'll I'll put some kind of models in the spreadsheet that I don't even understand. And that seems like really wrong because, well, we, why do we do it? Because we think we're not good at it, but this is actually the business itself. What mm -hmm. is an operational model and a financial forecast? It is yep. literally a software simulation of the business. The CFO from the outside isn't going to understand even how the business works. Of course not. Right? And so if you don't have the tools and understanding to create that yourself and to understand and communicate that model of how the business works to other people, then I think there's like tremendous inefficiencies. And it's why people in the rest of the company don't understand and can't be aligned on the right decisions to make. Same mm -hmm. decisions you and the CEO. So that third opportunity that we're seeing with a product like Runway is if we can help you understand how the business works, you know, beyond just like these indecipherable formulas. I think like we can make an impact to the way the business works, the same kind of impact that Figma has made the design, right? It yep. wasn't just about right. putting design in the browser. It was about making design a strategic center in the company and getting everyone else involved in design. Right. You're so good at talking about this. 
It's honestly like it's all like turning for half two and a half years. So here's my question for you. When you were doing this in 21 and you talked to other founders, did they tell you who the fuck cares? Or did they believe in 2021 that this was actually a problem? You, if you have the pain, you have the pain, right? And so the product that Runway is, if you don't have the pain, it's not going to be, it's going to solve problems for you, right? At right. some point, though, if you're in, so the way the, a, a customer sort of evolves is like when you just start, you think you need some accounting, right? You hire some people and you're like, I should get my books in order. And you for uh, well, your need for planning is not that sophisticated. You're basically all your costs are people. And maybe you hire a new person every quarter or so, and you're, and you need to calculate your running, right? And so your pain isn't that high, but at some point as a company gets to product market fit, starts to scale yep. and has departments at some point that spreadsheet just doesn't scale anymore. It becomes totally painful, difficult to understand. And that at that point, your pain is burning. And so. Mm-hmm. If you have that pain, you talk to us, you're like, yes, understand the problem you're trying to solve. Please help us. If you don't so, have that pain, you don't have that pain. So for you guys, are you guys targeting that that company that has hit product market fit and then you're looking to ingest it, all of the different systems into yours? Or are you looking to work with a company from inception and to be built around all of the different tools and whatever HR platforms and all of those other things? You know, we started with a pretty different product that was more focused on expense reporting and understanding your PNL. And that was more targeted to any company. And what we found is with that is that it's a problem. It's, it's more of a vitamin than a painkiller. Because if you're a small company, it's a problem that you think you have. And once you see it, you realize, okay, 90% of the are people. Mm-hmm. And next month, it's 90% of the are still people. And so the mo- amount of money you're willing to pay to solve that problem month after month is the round down to basically zero. Right. And so the real value is understanding the different scenarios when you do scale, right? Like what is the impact of investing in product X instead of B or working on conversion rates instead of retention or hiring for CX. Mm. Those are like the big decisions that are extremely valuable and very difficult to solve. And so we focus our products around a year and a half ago on that particular problem. And so as a result, the problem is targeted to product companies who are, have largely hit product market fit, but the real differentiator is, are you in a point where your company runs on your operating model or you run your company on the right? That is the case, then you should be probably be using runway because that point, then you have data integration issues, right? We, copy and pasting a bunch of data from different data sources into the spreadsheet and you're, you have all kinds of bugs. The model is sophisticated enough. You have enough stakeholders where that's where provisions and sharing becomes a problem. And the, those are the it problems. It really does beg the question. I've got to ask, Andy, it sounds like you have a strong opinion on this same thing on your side, Tiki. How early can a company run on an operating model? I'm actually like, if it, you know, it's about 10 million raise, like it's not that much. But to a degree, we try to do it. And in fact, we skew towards teammates that can run Excel models at my company, right? So I was wondering how early you think that a CEO could realistically run a company off an operating or runway really in this event. I mean, I think it does track pretty closely to product market fit, right? When you're chasing that rock down the hill. Yep. Like before that, it's nice to have some idea in your head of how margins are going to scale, but you're just playing with a toy business at that point. But when you have pure, pure, pure primary fit, that's when the big problems of scaling comes into play and being able to understand like how your margins scale is extremely important to the long-term success of the business. And so sure. mm-hmm. right around then is when you probably should be doing it. I would go with yes. And here are where I would say the and is the only difference with that is when you're selling a physical product, say consumer goods, yeah. anything, any of Evans customers or my previous company or mm-hmm. my upper company, Nanit. From day one, we had, we looked at gross margin and what it was going to cost us to make it and yeah. what the bomb would be. And then what is our operating model going to look like just so we can actually hit the gross margin targets? We didn't build something that was impossible to sell. Yeah. Uh, but I agree with you. Otherwise, I run an operating, I've run an operating model to every one of my companies, but it's super simple. It's, yeah. I got this employee at this salary, and then we sure. have some benefits and taxes. And that's pretty totally. much it. 
Yeah, that's almost I mean, everyone who runs a software business. They're just like, here are my people. I guess this mm -hmm. is my operating model. Yeah, it's nice gonna... not to have inventory. <laughs> you know, for to run a retail business, we need to have our models in place, right? To understand right. mapping and timing and all of that. So yeah, I think that's why I define it not necessarily as like product market fit, but when you have to run your business on the operating model. And so for this like retail, or do you see that's probably earlier than actual product market fit? That's when you need something like a big runway. Do you think that the businesses, so great examples would be a, like a, like an Uber Eats, Postmates, obviously you're involved in Postmates. Do you think that those businesses practically, they actually created that operating model from the beginning and scaled it? Or do you think that they actually were, and you probably have some inside baseball on this, that they actually were just trying to find something that people would actually enjoy can, or Instacart. Can I get people to order off an app and can I get it to them before actually worrying about the economics? I definitely have a, have an opinion at Chip. Uh, I did. I actually did it wrong. But I'm curious on your thoughts on, on, on these businesses that are relatively like very sensitive to the gross margins at scale or else they just won't ever become profitable. Yeah, I don't know firsthand for Postmates I joined in 2016, they're all like already fairly large, but for end of one of Sandbox, from what I understand, oh, I know for a fact they did not have an operating model because they joined. And so my guess is for most companies like this, it's about building something people want and hoping that the economics are going to work. I think, I don't know if that's the right way to do it, but that's probably my guess on how it actually happens. I mean, we're... Like, I don't know y'all if y'all have the, the same simplistic perspective that I have, but like fundamentally for me, when I think about building a software business or really any business in which software is like a differentiator, it's really about margin expansion. And so really what you're doing is you're saying, I'm, I'm happy that the one finance bro is agreeing with me on the panel here where he's nodding. That's great. That makes me feel good. And so when you're doing this, you should be able to just take any economic situation, any business and just say, okay, well, how much margin expansion can we get out of this as a result of software, basically, right? So you could start I, with anything, even if with negative unit economics and come up with some thesis about how you can get it to positive for, or something. I think that's right. And I think it's also as you, if you are like a B2B company, like going up market and thinking about what what like the margins actually may stay the same, but you're actually able to expand how much they'll actually spend with you for on a customer by customer basis. But I think that's actually even more important. Like we think today at, on running an operating model. So like I brand chip and like we had real people and Sandbox VR had like real like hard costs and everything. But in today's world, like when you have Andy's in this world, I'm sure that it's not like a big line item, his P&L right now, but like He's doing like real time video communications. And now we have AI. I don't know how much that's costing uh, open AI, but these are real costs. They're not people costs. They're not like actual facilities costs or anything like that. But you're going to have to probably be building that into the business like earlier on, even though it seems like a tech company. And I think that these companies have been built and also funded on that those are not real costs. And they think that they're just going to go into zero. I don't know if that's going to be the case or not, because I'm not running that type of business. I don't know. Andy, you're probably closest to this. <laughs> I have designed my operating model so that we don't use a platform as a service API on the audio and video side of things, because that will never scale in my category. And so we have thought about this from day one. What is a commodity? What is going to be something that will, as we scale, we'll get operating leverage on it? And what are things that will have be constant drags on margin? And what everyone has basically done with software is we traded CapEx to buy servers for gross margin for AWS, for EC2 and S3. Mm -hmm. And as we thought about how we built our, how we built Val, we built some very core technology because of what it would happen at, with margins at scale. There are other things we think about every, so I, I mean, CK, I think you, this would rest very well with you. How many different APIs does the average business use? Each one of those APIs, you're paying by the cent or the minute or the call. And all those used to be things you used to build, but they're actually drawing some margin. So yeah. it doesn't look, your average software business yep. today doesn't look like Workday did. When Workday, I think the story was when Workday went public, they were very low gross margin, 20 to 30% gross margin. They said, as we hit scale, will get to be like a 70% margin business. And what scale was the servers. 
and you are getting margin on your fixed costs. And today that's not the same. So I think it's super interesting to think about. AI in general has always been very low gross margin for this reason. Right. By the way, this is the most inside baseball episode that we've had. And I actually <laughs> love it because I feel that the 101 material is very well served out there in the world of like people talking shit on the internet. The 201, 301 material is not well served and is hard to find. And this is definitely one of those episodes. Kevin, why don't we finish it off with some more sort of 2023 stuff that you spotted and that you felt is worthy of discussion? Yeah. So, well, I don't think we've, we haven't answered. Well, I haven't got an answer for everybody else. Do we think crypto is dead? I'm definitely going to mm -hmm. put my hand up in the air and say, it's dead. Don't mm -hmm. build a web three. Crypto is dead. Build wow. a product that people actually want to use. There's some utility in it. We've now spent Bitcoin is 13 years old now. Like it's had enough time. Like Bitcoin, I think is actually a real product. And I think out of the hype cycle, there's a few of, of these products like Bitcoin that will people will continue to use. But I think that it's they're really it's been shown time and time again, like all of these billion dollar companies that have been billion dollar companies in quotations that have been created, they're not really per, like creating any true value. And it turns out to be that all of them have had a lot of intertwining dealings and just building on each other. There was actually a good post by Thomas from Red. He was at Red Point, but he left. Thomas, um, I think the name is pronounced Tungus. Tungus, okay. He just posted something and he actually looked at the addressable market of Web3 companies. And I believe it was like less than 10 billion total. So what his suggestion was that these Web3 companies should be selling into Web2 companies, which I actually didn't understand that. His last like paragraph didn't make any sense to me. But I, th I, I personally think this trend is over. Another, tr another prediction going into 2023 is that AI is going to take over everything. Mm -hmm. I, th I personally think it's too early. I am a big believer in AI, but I think that it's still in its research phase. I think that we have some cool like stuff happening. Chat GPT is really cool. It could get some like incremental and like improvements out of some people. So, but I don't think this is, 20, 2023 is not going to be the year. I'd probably call it in five years or something like that. But it will lead to some overfunding. This is going to be the, the next wave that's just it's going to get super overfunded. I think those two things don't believe are going to happen in 2023. I think what will happen in 2023 is that we're going to be forced to go back to actually like focusing on things that people truly want. And they are going to... There's still a lot of industries that have not been disrupted by technology. And I'll throw myself into the ring here. Logistics, one of the biggest industries in the world, has some of the lowest venture capital backing in it. There's probably 10 more other markets like that. So when you get this crunch on capital, raise these massive rounds and these hype cycles, I think people are going to be building more in those types of industries. And those are kind of my predictions. What do you guys think on crypto and AI going into, into this year? I'll tie it back to our margin conversation. I think it's going to be super interesting to see what happens with a lot of service businesses that have service components where you're labeling data, responding to tickets, dealing with stuff that requires language that historically has been, yeah. historically you'd use a call center or you'd use outsourced labor. I think you actually may get some margin improvements from language models. I don't know if we're going to see an AI end all be all, but language has language models in general have been very difficult for people to get to production grade. And we're starting to see it. So I'm more bullish on AI in general. Crypto, I've never taught, I've, ne I don't know enough about it to be smart about it. So I'm going to pass on that one. My guess is it's dead, but. Prove me wrong, anyone on this podcast. I want to hear of Seeky, though. You tell <laughs> us. You're the guest. AI. AI is good. I really like the way you framed the application of AI against margin. I think that's a really smart way of looking at where it's going to hit. That's something that's really cool. But as for crypto, I also do a yes and. I think within the scope of 2023, crypto is dead. But conversely, I also think that is why I'm actually long-term fairly bullish on crypto still. And I think that makes 2023 a really good year to build. If you look back in the past, 
when did you want to be in crypto? It wasn't last year or 2022, it was 2020, 2019. Mm -hmm. And there was a boom in crypto in 2017. You didn't want to be in crypto then. You wanted to be in crypto three years before that. And so, you know, we've seen gigantic swing in crypto, incredible amounts of leverage that people didn't even see that's created a, like a lot of not so great phenomenon. But the way I look at this is, do I believe in digital culture, digital ownership? I believe that is going to be a thing. I think more of our lives and more of our culture is going to be digital and ownership and pro property is going to be a part of that. And I think crypto and blockchain solves for that. So mm. the way I see crypto long term is if you look at the long term sort of like adoption, you see this crypto, it is growing linearly. But what you see on top of that is using incredibly over leveraged behavior that's creating like extremely accelerated cycles of bubbles. You know, it's the same kind of bubbles we've seen in tag we saw last year, but did just on like extremely accelerated cycles. So if you like cut out that noise, if you look at the base implementation and base amount of adoption, it is increasing linear. I have one question for Siki as we end. You're a prolific angel investor. What are your thoughts about investing in companies in 23? I mean, the old adage was the best companies are built during bear markets. So I'm curious what your thoughts are. I, I'm excited. As an investor, I'm pretty excited. I mean, if you're going to start a company next year, you really want to build something. You really want it. And you're doing it for the right reasons and you have the right constraints. And also the price is going to be right. So as an investor, I think it's going to be a huge opportunity. So the tourists you, are gone is your thesis. The tourists are gone? The, the tourists. tourists. Tourist. Sorry. I didn't think I said tortoise. <laughs> <laughs> heard the card model, but yeah, yeah, I think it does. There, there was a lot of looky loose over the past two years. What's it going to be like for a 26 year old VC? A 26 year old VC. <laughs> There's so many. <laughs> Might be I think there will be, there'll be a lot of little funds though, that will definitely have, you know, they had their cornerstone and also you had these little micro funds. CK, I'm sure yeah. you're in some of them, as a matter of fact, that I, I am. I, or <laughs> sure, so are one, right, exactly. I have exclusive access to deals or whatever. And, and they're all made up of these major institutions. Yeah. You know, Andreessen, Lightspeed, Sequoia, each put in like a million bucks into these micro funds. And these micro funds have to prove their worth, right? And some of these micro funds have invested in my current company, Practice, and I'm sure have invested in each of yours, including Runway. Not mine, though. Don't do it. He's invested in by Lehman Brothers. And so, you know, I call him Mr. Are, Lehman himself. He is, he sounds like a nice guy. They, they, it just seems like these funds, they need to prove themselves and that they have actual value. And like a certain percentage of them will probably end up being gone. They, I don't think there's any, you can't really disagree with that, right? It, no. It's pretty fundamental. Yeah. I mean, the I've never started a company, I have no skill set and I have no Rolodex, but I have some capital guys or goes and it, men and women are going out of business. Yeah, Andy, I don't know if you remember, happened. but back in the day, go ahead, Shikri. Yeah, most of these funds happen started over the past, like, what, one and a half, two years. Those are possibly the worst possible vintages today. Right, right. We'll be, there is a reckoning and it's happening yeah. probably right now. They've overpaid for a bunch of things and it, they're going to go sideways. Andy, I don't or know if you even... remember New York, New York, it used to be New York real estate families that all had a fund like this back in the day. And they were all during the era of WeWork and they're all gone. Or a huge I have studies. money on my cap table from one of them, actually. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. I did too. Well, why uh, don't on there on that note? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for taking the time. It's. Yeah, this is I'm great. I'm out of the 201-ness of this episode. It's great. 301, even. <laughs> yes. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much. All right, thanks, see everybody. Uh -huh. Bye. Hey, yeah, we keep it real and we bring you the facts. It's the Second Time Founders Podcast. Yeah. Talking tech news. The show is a must. Uh -huh. Not some billionaire uh -huh. trying to sell you their book. Uh -huh. We're coming from a real place. Plenty ups and downs. Got some insights. Join the discussion now. We being honest and raw. Giving you real talk. We've been at the bottom and made it happen and much more. The Second Time Founders Podcast. More building, less talk.